We have been looking at uh, several messages. This is the third one on false prophets. I've said this over and over again, and I will say it again. It is my desire to, and I think it is my responsibility to equip you for what exists in our world today. We are living in unprecedented times, without a doubt. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through our message today. But it is my responsibility to deliver to you the truth. And I realize this, that there are going to be times whenever the truth is not the most popular uh, message to preach, but it's what you need to hear. And so in our study of these false prophets, we have been looking at these individuals because I am a firm believer that while they existed in the Old Testament, they still exist today. They are dressed a little bit different. They're not wearing camel clothing of camel hair, and they're not eating locusts and wild honey. They're wearing suits and ties, and a lot of them are seated in political offices, and they are false prophets. They are false prophets. And so with what I am teaching through this through these messages, what I want you to understand is that there comes a time whenever as believers we need to push back. I, I don't mean we, 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 I'm not saying we are against government by any means, but there comes a time whenever you say no to mandates. You say no, that, that I'm not going to comply with that. Now some people would say this, well, and I've heard this and so I'm going to use it. They would quote these verses from Peter that says this, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the, to the king as supreme, or unto governors as, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, or for the praise of them that do well. So some people would quote that, and they would say, Well, look there, we're to, we're to be submissive to everything. No, listen, you've got to look at the Bible as a whole. There have been many times throughout history whenever God's people push back against the government that was over them. Let me give you uh, four examples that I have on my paper. I'll take you back to Egypt and the Hebrew midwives. Whenever they were commanded to kill the baby boys, they didn't do it. They didn't do it, rightly so. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego whenever Nebuchadnezzar had given the command that whenever everybody heard music, they were supposed to fall down and they were to worship the golden image. They didn't do it. They pushed back. They said, no, we will not comply. We will not do it. And somebody could look at that and they would say, well, it was just a golden statue. It was just a golden statue. That's all it was. It's not that big. You're making, somebody might have said to Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, you're making a big deal out of something little. I've heard that today. Let me tell you something. It is a big deal. It was a big deal to them. It was idolatry. And so they would not comply. How about the wise men whenever Jesus was born? You remember whenever they came rolling in from the east? And they asked, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Herod found out that, that there was a new king. And he found out these guys had come to see this king of the Jews that had been born. And Herod said to them, go find out where he's at. And whenever you find out, bring word back to me. Did they do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They would not comply with his order. How about the apostles in the book of Acts? Whenever they were told not to preach in the name of Christ, did they comply? No, they did not comply. So I want you to listen to something that I'm going to tell you. There are times whenever not complying is obedience to Christ. Absorb that. There are times when to not comply is actually obedience to Christ. And that's what we need to understand. That's what we need to understand. When do, I, when do we not comply? And so I think that you and I, we, what we really need to understand is what is going on today? What is going on? Because I'll tell you straight up, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. If you listen to the president the past week and the mandates that they issued about if you had a business that was 100 or more people that they're required that everybody in that business has to be vaccinated, the question was raised in a press conference, 
What about the people coming across the border? The answer was they don't have to be vaccinated, but you do. That's the mark of a traitor. He hates his own people. That's exactly what it is. It's a mark. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. It is the mark of a dictator. You do as I say. I'm not going to answer any questions about it. But this is the way that it is. And you and I, you as God's people and me as, as God's man, uh, pastor, we need to be able to recognize this. Because, look, there's a lot more going on than what you see on the surface. And I'm going to do my best to bring that out today as we go through this so we started out this series by identifying the false prophets and we went to this portion i'm only going to scan over this because we'll uh, hopefully i can get through all my notes today we'll see i won't keep you too long but deuteronomy 13 1 through 4 uh whenever moses he wrote this he said if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Okay, so here's the mark of a false prophet. It is somebody that comes and instructs or... or uh, mandates or whatever, whatever words you want to use, you and I to live in a disobedience to the Word of God. And, and we've talked about this. So I don't want to go too far into it, but I'll give you just an example in case you were not here. So if somebody comes along and, and they say, you can't meet, you can't gather in your church, you can't sing your praises to God, you can't do those things, you can't have a funeral for your people that, that have died. You cannot do that. You can't visit the, the, the widows and, and the afflicted and the orphans and, and those that are shut-ins. You can't visit them. When somebody comes and tells us those things, that is contrary to what God commands us to do. And so my responsibility is to say this, I will not comply. I will not comply because if I, if I obey that, I'm being disobedient to my Lord. So there's a situation where not complying is obedience to Christ. We are to be obedient to him. And I told you, you've got to watch out because those people will come underneath the banner of uh, compassion, uh, concern for your fellow man, uh, under the banner of health, they will say, well, this is best for everybody. You know, if you have compassion, you're not going to do that. I, listen, I'm going to tell you straight up, and I, and I will get it right from this. It doesn't matter what banner they fly under. If it is contrary, if it is a command contrary to the word of God, it is coming straight from the mouth of a false prophet. Because their desire was that they would come and they would lead people away from God. That was their that was their identity. Last week, we talked about their motivation. Their motivation is position and power. Watch, if you would, um, I want to read 1 through 12 of chapter 22 of 1 Kings. This is what we covered last week, and I wanna, I'm going to pick out a few things, and then, then we'll move on to where we're going today. But verse 1 says this, And they continued three years without a war between Syria and Israel. So the, the chapter opens up, in a quiet time, so to speak. Verse 2, And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, now he's a righteous, he is a righteous king, came down to the king of Israel. That would be Ahab, who is a wicked king. Okay? But the two got, some, they have something in common. Jehoshaphat entered into to, uh, several disastrous alliances with this king. One of them before this was that Jehoshaphat's, uh, Jehoshaphat, his son married the daughter of Ahab. He permitted that to happen. That should have never happened. Here you're going to see he's going to enter into another d disastrous alliance. But watch, uh, watch verse 3. It says, And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Okay, Know ye not that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? And we be still and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. So the king of Syria had promised that certain land would be given back to Israel, and they had not yet got Ramoth Gilead. So 
uh, Ahab says, you know what? We need to go. We need to get, we need to take back Ramoth Gilead, verse 4. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, because Jehoshaphat was visiting, okay? He says, what, will thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art. My people is thy people. My horses is thy horses. So, okay, so here they are. Jehoshaphat's visiting. They're connected in the family because of their children being married. And so while he's visiting and, and Ahab decides to go uh, to battle against Syria to take back Ramoth Gilead, he turns to Jehoshaphat and he says, how about you go with me? And, and Jehoshaphat, as I said, made a disastrous choice here because he says, I am as, as, uh, uh, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. That should have never been. That was an unequal yoke, and they should have never been joined together. But they did. Here, maybe, and I told you last week, maybe Jehoshaphat did it because maybe he was thinking, hey, this might contribute to uh, healing the divided kingdom. Maybe that's why. I don't know. We're not told that. But Jehoshaphat had some sense about him. Watch verse 5. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. He said, look, I'll go with you, but how about we get the opinion of God? How about we find out, not the opinion, but let's find out what God says about this battle before we go. So watch verse 6. And the king of Israel, that's Ahab, the wicked king, he gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, stop right there. These are not prophets of Baal, as I told you last week. That's not what they are. They are prophets, uh, claimed to be prophets of God, but they're not. They're prophets of Ahab. And these are 400 hand-selected prophets that Ahab keeps at his right side. They're on his payroll. And they, there was, there's no way in the world they're going to go against him because they're all, about, they're all about position and power. They want a seat at the table. So they're not going to, by any means, tell him anything that he doesn't want to hear. So they say, these 400 hand-selected prophets say, you know, uh, King, yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. It'll, Ramoth Gilead, the Lord will deliver it into your hand. Jehoshaphat, standing there, kind of senses, this just doesn't seem right. So verse 7, watch this, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Verse 8, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There's yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And so, so let, let me stop there for a moment because we talked about a couple things. And one of those things that I want to bring back up this week, and I want to extend that a little bit. And I want to ask you a question this week and, and say this. Which guy are you like? Are you like Jehoshaphat or are you like Ahab? And right away we'd say, well, I'd be like Jehoshaphat. I want to know what God says. Well, j just think about this. Have you ever had a situation in life... <clears throat> where you wanted something so bad that you would only go and you would only ask people that would tell you what you wanted to hear. That's Ahab. I will use that and I will say this to you. You be careful about desiring something so much that you don't want somebody to come like, like Micaiah. You don't want him to come because you don't want him to speak words that don't fit with the way that you want it all to unfold. So you avoid that. You're like Ahab. Let us learn to be like Jehoshaphat. And let us say this. You know what? We need to find out. This is something that I would really like to do. This is something that I would desire. But I want to know what God says. I want to know what he has for me. I want to make sure that I'm in the will of God. Let us be like that. Don't be like Ahab and, and just go ask people that you know are going to line up with you. Don't do that because you're going to put yourself in a very dangerous situation possibly. Watch, uh, watch verse 8 again. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There's yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire the Lord, but I hate him. 
For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. These two had met before. Micaiah and Ahab had met before, no doubt. And, and Micaiah was a guy that spoke the truth, even if somebody didn't want to hear it. Okay, so let me just remind you of this. And I told you this last week. If you are somebody that speaks the truth, don't expect to get invited to every meeting. There's going to be times when you're going to get cut out because they're going to say, you know what, don't bring that guy in. Don't bring him in because you know how he is. He's got that, he's got that biblical perspective. And sometimes that just gets under my skin. So don't bring him in. I don't want to hear what he has to say. Let's stick with these guys that are, these 400 that are on the payroll. It doesn't matter that they're saying what we want them to say and that they're doing it because they want a seat at the table and that they want to, they want, they love the position that they have and they, they want to rub shoulders with power. Don't, don't mind that. that. That doesn't make any difference. But just don't get that Micaiah guy into the meeting. So I'll say this to you, that if there's times you're not invited for your opinion, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Uh, that happens. There are going to be times that people don't want you around if you speak the truth. If you have a, a biblical perspective, they're not going to want you around. Watch 13 and 14. Or let me go down through verses, uh, keep going down through verse 12. I forgot about those verses. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. So what you have here is a theater. They set up kind of a theater, and, and the kings are in, a, in this place. They, they got their robes. They're seated on their thrones. And the prophets are out there in front of them, just delivering, saying, this is from the Lord, this is from the Lord. And then you got one guy. Watch verse 11. His name's Zedekiah. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenunnah, made him horns of iron. And he said, thus, shall, thus saith the Lord, with these shall thou push the Syrians until, they have until thou have consumed them. A very alarming verse. Because what this guy does, he takes, a, he takes a, some iron and he acts like he's got horns with the iron. And he's going around, he's got these things sticking off of his head. And, and you've got to picture this theater and how this guy's acting and what he does. And he gets them all whipped up into a frenzy. Watch verse 12. It says, And all the prophets prophesied, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. So this guy, Zedekiah, he whips them into a frenzy. And now they're all yelling, Yeah, go. Go take Ramoth Gilead. Go get it. It's yours. But what you need to understand, and we talked about it last week, so I'm not going to go too far into it. But in verse 11, Zedekiah did something. He reached back to the words of Moses whenever Moses was dying, back in Deuteronomy. We looked at the verses last week. And he pulled verses out of context whenever Moses was talking about Ephraim pushing with the horns. Zedekiah carries it here, complete out of context, has nothing to do with this situation whatsoever. And he twists it and he distorts it to make it look like his message is spiritual. I say to you, that is why it is so important that we know the Word of God. Because this happens all the time. It happens all the time. I hear politicians that have absolutely no relationship with God whatsoever. And I know that because the fruit of their life is evidence of that. And they will quote verses to, to justify what they are doing. Listen, you've got to know the context. But that's the way false prophets operate. That's what they do. They will distort the scriptures to get you to go away from the will of God. That's exactly what they will do. Watch verses 13 and 14 now. In the messenger that was going to call Micaiah, spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare, Good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Hold on a moment. 
So I told you last week, this guy, this is the messenger. He goes to get Micaiah. We don't know how long the journey is back, but he's coming back. And as they get ready to approach this area by the King's Gate, where the theater, the theatrical performance is happening, that he says to Micaiah, just stop for a second. I want to tell you something. Here's what you're walking into. 400 prophets are saying that God is going to deliver Ramoth Gilead into the hands of the king. And a king likes that answer. Don't go in there and rock the boat. Just go along with their message. Don't go in there. Don't rock the boat. Go along with their message. Don't upset the apple cart. Here's what we talked about there last week. Listen, watch this. When we speak the truth of God's word, there's going to be the temptation to soften the message. Somebody's going to say, don't listen. There's a, let me put it, let me bring it into your life. So you got a family gathering. It's Christmas time. Okay. Somebody's, somebody that's there may say something like this to you. Don't bring up your relationship with God. Don't mention that in this in our family let's just keep peace here okay don't upset don't upset the apple cart you know all you got to do is mention that and then everybody's that it divides the family and and so just keep quiet maybe they call on you to pray and somebody says well look you know it pulls you aside look be careful what you pray about be careful what you say in a prayer because oh aunt jezebel is here i'll use that that way i don't get anybody here Aunt Jezebel's here. You know how she feels. You know her roots. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. You just keep her quiet. Keep it, keep it on a low key, okay? Don't, that's what's happening right here. Don't go into that meeting. Don't flip it all upside down. Just tell them what they want to hear. And I, and I love verse 14. Watch this. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Let us be a Micaiah. Even if Aunt Jezebel don't like it. And I have an opportunity to proclaim the truth of God's word. That's what I need to do. That's what I need to do. Now, it's going to get really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to bring you to the next point that I want you to see. Not only will speaking the truth bring temptation, but speaking the truth will bring confrontation. Okay, I want you to think with me for a moment. I want you to think... Who Micaiah is about to step in front of. He's made a commitment. He made a commitment in verse 14. As the Lord liveth what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he's got a commitment. Okay, he's made it. Now the question is, is he going to have the resolve to deliver it, the truth? Because he's going in front of a man that is the most wicked king that Israel has ever known. Watch 1 Kings 16, 30 through 33. And they have the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as it had been a, a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jer, uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more, watch this, more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Okay, so, so you got to paint the picture for you. you got a wicked king. Okay, now listen to me. He and Jezebel had all the prophets of God slain. He, Ahab wanted the vineyard of Naboth so bad that Jezebel had Naboth killed accused him of blaspheming God and had him stoned to death and Ahab stepped in and took the vineyard that he wanted. Never ask any questions. So Micaiah's got every reason to think that whenever he steps in here and he speaks the truth that it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well. Matter of fact, he may not survive this meeting if he speaks the truth. That's what's hanging over his head. And I'm going to tell you something. He knows it. He knows it. So the question is, will he have the resolve to speak the truth? Watch verse 15. So he came to the king. 
The king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered, Now at first you think, boy, well, doesn't have the resolve. Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. It's exactly what the other prophets said. But he, apparently he spoke with sarcasm. Because watch verse 16. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? So, so Ahab detects that there is sarcasm. And so he exhorts him. He said, Look, I told you I want the truth. But the bottom line is this. He doesn't want the truth. And he can't handle the truth. Watch verse 17. Here it is. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Why not? Because Ahab's going to die in the battle. That's the message. These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. Okay, so let me go back to the resolve of this guy, Micaiah. He's got it. He made a commitment. He said, I'll speak whatever the Lord gives me to speak. This is what God revealed to him. Ahab, here's what's going to happen. I don't care what those 400 guys say. Ahab, whenever you go to battle, you're going to die. You're going to die. Israel's going to be like sheep without a shepherd. They're going to come back home, and you are going to be dead. You are going to be dead. Watch verse 18. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? Okay, you remember what he said? I want the truth. Now he says, I don't want the truth. He couldn't handle it. And so what, he, what, what happens is this, that he's offended. He's offended by the truth, but he takes it out on Micaiah takes it out on him. And so what happens is the hatred gets channeled toward the messenger because he can't do anything about the message. The message is the message. When a person comes to hate the message, whenever it is the truth, and they come to hate the messenger, I should say, it's a manifestation of the wickedness in their heart. Understand that? When somebody gets angry with somebody for the message that they are delivering, it is a manifestation of the wickedness that is within the heart. If you give me a message that I don't want, I don't have any right to, to, to hate you. I don't have any right to hate you. You're just delivering the message that you feel you ought to deliver to me. I'm not going to hate you for it. But if I have a tremendous amount of wickedness in my heart, then I will. Then I will. Let me get you to an application. For this reason that is right here, of the way Ahab acts, and because of the wickedness in people's hearts today, we can expect to be hated whenever we preach the truth. Maybe not here. Maybe here. I don't know. Uh, maybe somebody would get offended with the truth here. I'm sure it's happened before. But especially out in the world, that the world's desire or, or in a gathering wherever you're invited or whatever, a lot of times the, the desire is that we just go with the flow. Go with the flow. Agree with the majority. Agree with the majority. The bottom line is that there are a lot of people that don't want to hear the truth of God's Word. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it does not align with the way they desire to live their lives. That's why. They have an image in their mind. They have, a, they have a picture in their mind of the way that they want to live their lives. And whenever the truth is delivered, they don't want to hear the truth because it doesn't line up with what they desire to unfold. I've had people say to me before, I, I'll go back to what I said whenever somebody doesn't get offended. Yes, they do. Because I remember a family, a family that left here and, and they told me straight up, sitting at their dining room table, they said this. They said, we don't like your messages. I said, what do you mean? 
They said, because you tell us everything's not going to get better. I said, that is God's message, not mine. Well, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that things will not get better. And so what the, uh, I stepped away from that, and they left, and that's fine. Uh, the, you, listen, if somebody's going to do that, you don't have to go very far before you can find something that you want to hear. There's always somebody out there to fill that void, that's for sure. But I realized this, that they were people that were living in a fantasy world, thinking things were going to get better. That happened years ago. I've run into them since, but I've not done it. But all I've wanted to, I've wanted to say, have you watched the news lately? Do you remember what I got accused of? And so, but I wasn't going to do that. That wouldn't do anything. But the flesh side of me wanted to bring that back up, but it's never done it. But I will say this, that don't expect that you are going to be appreciated when you proclaim the truth in amongst a group of people that don't want to hear the truth. You become the whipping post for the truth. They're going to turn on you because they can't change the message. So they're going to turn on you. Watch what uh, Jesus said in John 3. He said, he, it, verses 18 through 20, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Let me get you back to Ahab for a second. Ahab in this scene is so dead that he can't even respond with repentance. Did you catch that? Here's a man of God, and he knows it full well. And, 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 and he tells Ahab, look, you're not, coming, you're not surviving a battle. You're not surviving a battle. His heart has been hardened so much because of his rejection of God. The prophecy of his death does not even impact him. Neither will the next verses, which should have shocked him into reality. And it won't even phase him. And I'll show you that whenever we go down through here. But let me do a little bit of mind reading now for Ahab and these 400 men that are here. So they prophesied that Ahab is going to be successful. They're listening to Micaiah. Micaiah says, nope, you're going to die, Ahab. So these 400, as well as Ahab, they're wondering, how could 400 be wrong and one be right? That's what they're thinking. How could 400 be wrong and one be right? Let me use that for a moment and tell you this. The majority is most of the time not right. Okay? Be careful about following the majority. I'll talk about that whenever we get down to the end today. Micaiah is about to explain how he can say what he says. And it's a marvelous portion of Scripture. Watch starting in verse 19. And he said, this is Micaiah speaking, Hear thou, therefore, the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. And there came one forth, and there came forth a spirit, and it stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. Hmm. Interesting portion of Scripture. Micaiah has been permitted to see into the presence of God whenever there is a meeting with these demonic spirits, fallen angels. And God asks a question. 
Who's going to persuade Who's going to persuade Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead? And these demonic spirits start coming forth, and one of them comes forth, and he says, "I'll do it. I'll put. I'll go, and I'll. I'll I will. I will put a, a a lying spirit in the lips of every one of these prophets, that they will deceive Ahab. Every one of them." You say, boy, is that the same God we worship today? Yes, it is. You say, why would he do that? Why would God permit the evil spirit to deceive Ahab? Let me give you a couple reasons why. Okay? First of all, Ahab had rejected the Lord so many times, this would be judgment on him. Understand that. You cannot suppress the truth over and over and over and over again and not have consequences. These would be the consequences. He would be led to a battle and there he would die. Okay? God will also use these prophets because they don't bow to God, but they bow to Ahab. They're deep into idolatry, and so they set themselves up to be deceived by this demonic spirit that is going to come and it's going to work through them and it's going to convince them that this is the way the battle is going to unfold. So that's why God permitted it. And let me get you to an application because there is a warning here that I want you to see. I'm here to tell you this, and I believe this to be 100% accurate, that many of the people today that are shouting out orders in our nation they are people who have not bowed to God. They have not bowed to God. They're deep into idolatry. Deep. They've rejected God. They've rejected His Word. And it's obvious. You say, how, how can you say that? Because they, they are in favor of abortion and homosexuality and transgenderism and socialism. That's a rejection of God. They can't have a relationship with God and support those things. That's impossible. So they have rejected God. And so it is a very high possibility that what you are seeing in our world today is the work of demonic spirits, just like they worked back here, and they are permitted, those demonic spirits are permitted to work through what I'm going to call the false prophets today who would be, many of them would be politicians that have suppressed the truth of God. So what you're seeing, I believe, today is you're seeing a tremendous amount of demonic influence. It's setting the stage. Let, let, me, let, me, let me go a little further. You, okay, so let me ask this question. Why would God permit that today? Why would he permit that today? I'll give you two reasons. Okay, here's one of them, and I want you to pay attention to this. It's a test for God's people. We're to be people of faith. We're to be people of faith. And so the test is this. Where, what am I going to rest my faith in? Am I going to rest my faith in this book, or am I going to rest my faith in somebody that comes forward that supports abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism, and socialism? Where am I going to put my faith? Where is it going to rest? And I think that God puts it right in front of our eyes. We talked about this the last couple weeks, whenever he talked about false prophets. He said this, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They've come clothed in this in this robe that, that says we are all about compassion and we're all about, we're all about caring for the people. He says, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. And then he says this, you shall know them by their fruits. Their fruits are the, the, the support advocating for the abortion and the homosexuality and everything else that goes along with it. You shall know them by their fruits. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. It's obvious. I was thinking about that this week, and I thought this to myself. How must it break the heart of our Lord whenever His people have more faith in the ungodly than they do in Him? How must He, how much, how must he feel that we rest more faith in the words of the ungodly than we do in His Word? It's not the way it's to be. And so I say this. That it's a test. It is a test. 
And I can assure you this, that there are many more coming. There are many more coming. But then there's the second reason, and I want you to pay attention to this too. It is to lead and prepare the ungodly for the tribulation. I'm going to share a story with you. Dave Kistler, uh, when he spoke in at Altoona at the convention that they had, he shared it. And somebody shared it with me, and I've, I've, uh, I've not yet brought it out, but I'm going to. He was talking, uh, you know, Dave has a lot of connections. One of the connections he has is with a lady from the CDC. The CDC, this lady was telling Dave Kistler that they're not, they want to roll out vaccines a lot quicker. So she said they have something that is tabled, tabled, okay? I'm saying that. It's, it's been brought out, it's talked about among them, but it's not yet implemented. She said they're, think, they're thinking about mail, sending them out in the mail. And she explained to Dave, she said it would come in, a, it would be a little square card, and on the bottom of it, it would have micro needles. And it would have, on those micro needles would be sugar because your body will absorb sugar through the skin. So what they would do, they would, they would put the vaccine on those micro needles and that would be placed, she said, on the back of the hand. Why? Because she said, I, she, she was hesitant to use the word tattoo, but she said it will leave a tattoo that can be scanned with the telephone or a scanner. You tell me it's not a precursor for what's coming. I can assure you it's a setup. It's, it's prepping the minds of people because, watch what, watch what Daniel wrote back in Daniel 7, 24 and 25. And the ten horns out of, the, out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them and, and shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Watch this. And think to change the times and the laws. If you listen, I told you this. If you listen to Joe Biden this past week, you heard a dictator. You heard a dictator. That's what a dictator sounds like. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to use, we're going to abuse our power. He didn't use the word abuse. But we're going we're gonna to abuse our power, and we are going to push this forward. And anybody that gets in our road, we are going to run right over top of you. We will answer to no one. We will not be accountable, accountable to anybody. That is a dictator. That is, look, it's changing so rapidly because when the Antichrist comes, that's what, this is, that's what Daniel's saying right here. He will change the times and the laws. And so whenever he comes, the, the changes won't upset people. He won't have to invent anything new. He can just come and do what he's going to do, and it'll be accepted. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. And this is going to progress more and more and more and more. You've heard this before. I've heard this promoted from, I'm not a CNN watcher. I'm I'd stay away, try to stay away from as much news as what I possibly can. But this has been brought out on CNN, and I heard Don Lemon say it, that he thought that anybody that refused a vaccine should not be allowed to shop in a, in a grocery store. You can't buy or sell. You see where it's at? You see where it's at? And it's, it is, listen, under the demonic influence that is going on in the world today, it is being absorbed like you can't even believe. People are lining up. They will line up. If I'm telling you, if the way our society is today, if they sent the, the little thing out in the mail that went on the back of the hand, people would love that because now they, people that don't have a tattoo and want one and are afraid to get one because what's mom and dad going to say? Now I can get one because nobody will say anything about it. But they'd take that in a minute. They take it in a minute. It don't matter. And, and so I'm saying this, that, that, that what is going on, a lot of this has a lot to do with demonic influence. Let me tell you another reason why I say that. And boy, I'm looking up at a clock and I'm thinking, Bob, turn that back if you don't mind. 
Remember in Corinthians, whenever we were looking at, uh, I think it's chapter 10, but I don't know, don't quote me on that, but Paul was talking about uh, idols. And, and in, in that study, I revealed to you that demons attach themselves to idols. So when somebody worships an idol, they set themselves up, they set themselves up for demonic influence. Listen, we are surrounded by idolatry. It is wide open for demonic influence. It is wide open. And so that's what's going on. But there's more. There's more. I want to show you something. And I, because of the time, I got to run through this quick. Here's what you're seeing unfold today. Okay, I'm going to show it to you. Here's what's unfolding. Watch this. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Anybody that suppresses the truth is under the wrath of God. It's being revealed. That's a present tense word. Verse 19 is the explanation. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so they know, everybody knows that there is a God. Everybody knows that. Everybody that exists today has the law of God written in their hearts. So they know murder is wrong. They know killing babies is wrong. They know homosexuality is wrong. It just... It doesn't make sense. They know that. They know that lying is wrong, that stealing is wrong, they, they, using the Lord's name in vain. That's built into each and every one of us. So they got it, but what they do, what many of them do, they suppress it. They don't let it affect them. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, okay, but instead they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, Okay, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It, watch what they do. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Okay, here comes the idolatry. Made like unto corruptible, made like to corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. I could use that and I could say they're worshiping creation. They're worshiping creation. Okay, so you got the you got the people today, the the uh, uh, the people that that want to preserve the earth we got to go green because we want to preserve the earth we got to and, and this all this talk about mother nature it's not mother nature it's god okay watch verse 24 wherefore god also now watch this he gave them up to uncleanness so so what we're seeing today is we're seeing that god has removed the moral restraints off of Mankind, and you are seeing the results of the depravity of man combined with the demonic influence because of all the idolatry. Let me go on. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Then I jump to verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient being filled, watch this, and you tell me this doesn't describe our day, with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Watch the last verse 32 who knowing the judgment of god that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them it's all over the place today it's all over the place today and so what we are seeing today just like here i believe we are seeing a tremendous amount of demonic influence and and that is going to progressively get worse as time goes on. Watch verse 27. Let me bring you back here for a moment, if I could. Uh, let me pick it back up. I stopped in uh, 
Verse 24. Let me go to verse 24. Watch this because I missed something here. It says, But Zedekiah, the son of Chenunnah, went near. This is after Micaiah spoke. And he smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day, when thou shalt go into the inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison. Feed him with bread of affliction, with water of affliction, till I come in peace. Okay, a couple things I want you to see. One is this. One is this. That whenever you and I stand for the truth of God's word, there, there are going to be consequences with that. There will be consequences that will come, just like here. He gets punched in the face, then he's taken and he's thrown in prison where he's given meager rationings. So whenever you decide that you're going to stand for the truth, understand that there will be consequences. But I want you to see verse 27 because you missed something. Watch this verse again. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him. This is Ahab speaking, by the way. Feed him with bread of affliction, with water of affliction, until I come in peace. He's confronted with the truth several times, and he refuses to believe it. And he will walk right into destruction. He will walk right into destruction because of his rejection of God. Listen, we are living in a world that is being led, so to speak, right down the path toward the tribulation period, where many of them will be destroyed. And the reason being is because they have rejected God over and over and over and over again. Over and over again. And they think it's all going to be okay, just like Ahab. They think it'll be all, it'll be fine. It, it's listen, things are going to get better. I have, I've heard that people think, well, wait till the next election; it'll change. No, it won't. It's not going to. This is the path that it's on, and this is where it's going to continue down this path. And y you just wait till about Christmas or the first of the year and see how different things are from what they are today. It's going to progress down that or degress down that path. Let me get you back. To Micaiah. Let me give you one more thing about this guy. Okay. That was the one that I had that I was going to share with you. And I jumped over these. Let me go. Here it is. When we speak the truth, we will often stand alone. We will often stand alone. Don't forget that. Don't look for a big company around you. Don't look for people to join up with you whenever you, st whenever you speak the truth because... Whenever you speak the truth, you will often stand alone. Let me give you two things to remember as we come out of this. Today, we're going to come back. I want to finish this out because I want you to see the battle and everything. Number one, or one point, don't be deceived by the majority. Don't be deceived by the majority. The majority is not always right. And there is a lot of demonic deception happening. So you be very, very careful about following after the majority. Second thing, don't be afraid to stand alone. It's okay. Don't be afraid to stand alone. Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 4, 2 Timothy 16 and 17. He said, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may be laid, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Listen. You want to know there are a lot of things that are needed today, but I'll tell you one thing that's needed is God's people who are willing to use their minds and do some critical thinking and look at situations and look at scenes and say, you know what, this isn't right. Something here is not right. What we're being pushed into, what's going on, this is not right. And don't be afraid to say that. Don't, don't be afraid to say it. Keep in mind that a much, I believe much of what we're seeing is demonic influence, not only from those that are promoting different things, 
but also those that have bought into it. And, and we're not going to be part of the majority. We're not going to be. We're going to have to stand alone at times when you're at work or maybe whenever you're with your family or wherever it might be. There's going to be times whenever you've got to stand alone. But you are not alone because God's with you. We need to stand up. There, there is a need for people with backbones to stand up and say, you know what, I'm seeing things here that I just can't quite connect the dots. And so this isn't right. And that's what we need to recognize. We need to speak up. There's a lot at stake. You know, I'll say this. Once we lose our freedoms here, you're not going to get them back. You're not going to get them back. I was talking to Tucker on the phone last night. He said something that stuck in my mind, and I know he won't mind me using this, but I will say this to you. He said there was a, a preacher had said that somebody said to him, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have lived back in biblical days whenever Jesus walked the earth? And the preacher reminded that individual that we are in biblical days right now, and we are. It's unfolding. You're seeing prophecy unfold right before us today right before us. It's unfolding. So it is our responsibility to be a Micaiah and have resolve and not be afraid to proclaim the truth. That's what we have to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, there is just, with everything in our world, Lord, there's so many things to talk about. There's so many things to consider. But Lord, going back to what I said, there is such a need for people to be like Micaiah, us that know you to be willing to stand up and to proclaim the truth, even whenever it's not popular, even if it's against 400 that say the opposite. Lord, we need to stand for the truth. Help us not to look for a crowd that will join us because a lot of times we will stand alone. Help us not to look for praise because many times there are consequences that come whenever we proclaim the truth. We will become outcasts, and that's okay. Lord, it is your word that will prevail in the end. Might we never forget that. As we proclaim the truth, there may be one people in the midst of the 400 that will say, I need to know more about what that guy's saying. God may use our truth. You may use our truth to speak to those individuals. So, Father, give us the resolve of Micaiah. Help us to stand up whenever that opportunity is there. Help us to have minds to think critically. Lord, help us to step back and look at situations, not be afraid to ask questions. For, Lord, we are living in times whenever I, there is a tremendous amount of demonic influence. And so we got to be ever so careful. Take the message today. Use it, Father, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.